everyone. Welcome to the third Sunday of Easter. Here's a gospel proclamation according to Luke. That very day, the first day of the week, two disciples of Jesus were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem named Emmaus, and they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that as they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and began to walk with them but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. So he said to them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said to him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He said to them, what sort of things? And they said, the things that happened to Jesus, the Nazarene, a prophet mighty in word and deed before God and all the people. How our chief priests and rulers both delivered him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. Though we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Besides all this, this is the third day since these things took place. And some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, but came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Some of those with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had described, but him they did not see. He said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke! Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them what referred to him in all the scriptures. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going on farther. But they urged him, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was at table with them, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. And with that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us as he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? Then they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered the eleven and those with them, who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised, and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had happened on the way, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. This story from Luke the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus is one of my favorite in all of scriptures. And over the years, I can say I've probably read this gospel and preached on it many, many times. And yet I had an experience earlier this week that helped me to hear this story afresh. So I would like to share that experience with you and then hopefully make some connections that will help all of us see this story in a kind of new way. So a couple of days ago, uh, I decided I wanted to get gas in my car. I also decided, or I hoped, that I wanted to get gas in such a way that I would not contact any virus that might be lingering on the gas pump in any way. And so I made a plan. And here's how things unfolded. I went to the Sunoco station on South Lakeshore Marginal, just east of East 200th Street, as I just before I would get onto the shoreway. And much to my surprise, uh, there was not a single car in the gas station, nor did I see any other human beings. So I pulled up to the pump of my choice and turned off the ignition, but left the key there because I did not want to have to handle the key more than I had to after pumping the gas. Then uh, I took out my wallet removed my credit card, and then um, made sure again that the car door was unlocked so that I wouldn't be locked in when I got out. Then I put on my mask 
and put on my glove, my one latex glove on my left hand, because I had figured that I could pump the gas using just one hand. So I got out of the car and I went over to the pump and got ready to uh, key the, or respond to the prompts at the gas pump, but had some difficulty inserting the card into the credit card slot. It was sticking uh, and I couldn't quite figure out why. And again, my plan was to use the card, throw the card back into the car, and then answer the prompts. My plan seemed to be having some difficulty. And just as I was about to push forward with this plan, there was someone who came up behind me who I had not seen. It was a man. He tapped me on the shoulder and kept on walking right by. And as he kept on walking right by, he turned and pointed to the pump and said, that's a diesel only pump whereupon he vanished from my sight. And I have to tell you that my heart was burning within me as I recognized that I almost put diesel fuel into this car. Uh, my, what I wanted, what I hoped for, and what I had planned, unfortunately, almost, <laughs> almost came to pass. Were it not for a stranger who appeared, offered a revelation to me, and then vanished from my sight. This, I think, looking back, is a kind of Emmaus experience. It kind of sheds some light on what happened to these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And these elements of desire or wanting something, of hoping how it will happen, of planning to be a part of it, and even a vanishing person all come into play as the story unfolds. So let's look more closely at the story as Luke tells it. And really, what happens in this story is a double disillusionment. One disillusionment happens for the disciples at the beginning of the story, and the second happens near the end. The first disillusionment happens uh, as they are leaving Jerusalem. And uh, we are told that they are talking about all the things that had happened, and that they look downcast. They're prevented from seeing Jesus when he comes to walk along with them. Uh, what they wanted, they didn't get. Who they had hoped would realize their wants for them didn't materialize. Uh, the plan that they had to walk with Jesus and so enter into uh, his kingdom with him, that just did not materialize. And he vanished from their sight by being handed over to death and crucified. Uh, indeed, they were disillusioned the illusion that they had of what was going to unfold with Jesus uh, was thoroughly um, taken away from them, and they were downcast. That's the first disillusionment. Uh, the second disillusionment, I think, happens in near the end of the story. And this time, I think it begins with the breaking of the bread, when they recognize who Jesus is and then he vanishes from their sight. The vanishing is really, really important here because this vanishing discloses to them, reveals to them something about what they wanted, who they wanted to do it, how they would plan to be a part of it, and what would unfold going forward. And his vanishing confronts them. They say, we need to look at this anew because things are different than what we expected. We need to reevaluate, perhaps reimagine. Maybe our imaginations were far too small as we thought about who this Jesus is or was and what he would bring about. But a question lingers for me. How is it that it was in the breaking of the bread that they recognized him? Now, the, perhaps the most obvious answer that comes to mind is well, he did that at the Last Supper. And that's true, but that's only a small part of why they recognized him, I think. Because if we look at how Luke tells the story of Jesus and his ministry and the inbreaking of the kingdom of God, Jesus often uses meal settings or stories about meals to describe the kingdom. 
And by vanishing from their midst, in effect, Jesus invites the disciples to revisit those stories and those occasions where they were at meals with Jesus and to see what those stories and occasions disclosed about the kingdom of God, how they might have missed some things or perhaps misunderstood some things. And now having recognized Jesus and the breaking of the bread, they say, okay, let's look anew. And so I went back and I looked at Luke's gospel. Again, the story is told as by Luke. And I was kind of curious to see what kind of meal settings or stories unfolded in Luke's gospel. And here are, uh, there are many of them, and here are uh, the stories I found in the order in which they appear in Luke's gospel. Uh, recall that one day Jesus is at the home of a, one of the leading Pharisees, and he's dining with them, and a woman comes and anoints his feet, and the Pharisee says, uh, if this were, if Jesus knew the kind of person this woman was, he would never let him touch her, touch him. And Jesus challenges him and says, she has treated me well, and she's treated me more nicely than you have. Jesus is saying something about the kingdom of God in this story. And then, of course, there is the feeding of the crowd. When the disciples want Jesus to uh, dismiss the crowds, he says, give them something to eat yourself. He's saying something about the kingdom of God. Um, when he sends his disciples out on mission, two by two, he says, stay in whatever house you enter and eat what they set before you. There's something in there about what the kingdom of God is all about. He visits Martha and Mary, and there's this tussle between Martha and Mary where Martha says, tell her to help me. And Jesus discloses something about what hospitality at table is all about. There's a story about the kind of conduct that's appropriate at banquets. So Jesus says, when you come to a banquet, don't take the highest seat, but rather take the lowest seat in case someone greater than you comes, then you would have to proceed shamefacedly to the lowest place. But when you come to the banquet, take the lowest place. There's something about the kingdom being disclosed here. And Jesus says, when you give a banquet, don't invite your friends and relatives and wealthy neighbors because they might be able to repay you. Invite the needy, the blind, the poor. There's something about the kingdom being disclosed in this meal story. There's the story that we call the prodigal son. And recall what happens when the son comes back. The father throws a banquet for him, and he works hard to convince his other son to come into the banquet. There's something about the kingdom being disclosed here. And then there's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man dresses in purple and dines sumptuously every day while Lazarus is at, his, uh, at the door covered with sores. There's a story about the kingdom here. And then there's a the story of Zacchaeus. The short tax collector has to climb a tree to see Jesus. He comes down and Jesus says, I must stay with you today, Zacchaeus, at your house. And he goes in to eat with him, causing a stir among all those who saw this. There's something about the kingdom there. And then, of course, there's the Last Supper. And now the story about the road to Emmaus. Over and over and over again, Jesus teaches something about the kingdom and begins to inaugurate that kingdom using meal settings or on the occasion of a meal. That, I think, is why their eyes were opened when he broke the bread and gave it to them. The vanishing is really important. It's really important so that they are not overconfident. It's really important so that they can see that they have to look again. They have to re-examine. And they have to keep looking at their, these stories and their life experiences over and over and over again in the light of the breaking of the bread which then, of course, brings us to ourselves. Because we might be tempted to be overconfident in our understanding of the Easter mystery, our understanding even of the breaking of the bread that we do when we come together to celebrate Eucharist, even as we are sharing bread at our tables with family and friends. We might be overconfident that we really understand the deepest significance of those things and the challenges and opportunities that they offer to us. It's a little ironic that we hear a story about the breaking of bread, one that evokes Eucharistic overtones for us at a time when we cannot be at the altar table to eat and drink bread and wine and become the body and blood of Christ. But yet we can with these two disciples who recognize Jesus in the breaking of bread and then vanish from their midst. We can revisit these other stories of the kingdom 
and we can, in this revisiting, we can even now begin to discover afresh what the unfolding kingdom of God brought to us through the risen Christ makes possible for us. Amen. You know, during the Easter time, normally on Holy Saturday, uh, people bring food to be blessed for the first Easter meal. And obviously we couldn't do that this year. So I thought by way of prayer, we could revisit that blessing. We can tinker with it a little bit so that we can ask God to continue to bless our Easter meals, our breaking of bread with whomever we happen to be in our particular circumstances. And so I'm going to ask you to respond to each of these intercessions by saying in your place, Lord, prepare us for the feast of life. That this Easter season may find us cleansed of sin and ready to live anew our Christian faith, we pray, Lord, prepare us for the feast of life. That the bread we share may be a reminder of the bread of life we share in the Eucharist, we pray, Lord, prepare us for the feast of life. That we may be ready to give from our table to those who hunger and thirst, we pray, prepare us for the feast of life that we may one day enjoy the banquet of the Lord in the heavenly kingdom. We pray, Lord, prepare us for the feast of life. And let us pray. God of glory, the eyes of all turn to you as we celebrate this Easter victory of Christ over sin and death. Bless the food that we share at our tables. May we who gather at these tables one day gather again at the Lord's table at the Eucharist and continue to celebrate the joy of his resurrection and be admitted finally to his heavenly banquet. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Stay wise, stay safe, stay healthy. Have a good week. When the